Welcome to our Lunch and Learn program. Ladies? Starting with Jesse. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Bayless. I am the Library Services Supervisor for Civic and Social Information Services with Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. I'm part of a new initiative called Civic CLP, which is your place to learn about civic life and the importance of the First Amendment through library programs, services, and information resources. It's my pleasure to be here with you all. I'm going to turn it over to Lori now. Thank you, Jessica. My name is Lori Hagen, and I work for Allegheny County Law Library here in the ninth floor of the City County Building. And I am one of the reference librarians, as well as the community outreach programming librarian here. Um, we are, this workshop, we're hosting this workshop as part of our mission for equal access to justice and community outreach programming for the residents of Allegheny County and surrounding areas. And our slide, if you get, you can see that our, where our address is, actually that should be <laughs> 921 City County Building, just so you know. Um, and there's our website is there. If you need any information, let us know. We also, I put together a lib guide with this information about the state materials that we have uh, available here as well as, it, websites elsewhere so thank you <clears throat> my name is tom bailey i'll be the moderator today i am the pittsburgh for modern courts pittsburgh program coordinator pennsylvania's for modern courts is the only statewide nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring that all pennsylvanians can come to our courts with confidence that they will be heard by qualified, fair, and impartial judges. <clears throat> Upcoming events for PMC include a Threats to the Pennsylvania Constitution. That'll be on April 12th at 6.30 in the evening. It is hosted by PMC, the Judicial Independence Project of Pennsylvania, a Common Cause, New Pennsylvania Project, and the panel includes Craig Green, uh, also my former law professor at Bruce Lederwitz from Duquesne, and Roger Smith, and it will discuss the threats to Pennsylvania's constitution. Also, we have a Courts Basic workshop, April 20th. Uh, that's gonna be hosted by the Bethel Park Library. Uh, then a How to Administer a State. Uh, Mr. Zachariah will be presenting again. This one will be uh, hosted by Mount Lebanon Library, Jefferson Library, and Mount Pleasant Hills Library. So if you enjoy this program, uh, please refer us on to other persons. I might watch it on April 21st. And then we end the month, April 28th, a landlord-tenant uh, workshop that is hosted by Northern Library. We have a benefit coming up, beginning of May, and we're very, we are very proud to welcome President Judge Kim Berkeley Clark of the 5th Judicial District here in Allegheny County as our keynote speaker. Uh, we're also gonna be honoring Judge D. Brooks Smith of the United States Court of Appeals. He's gonna be presented with the Judge Johnson Award. And Judge Johnson uh, passed away last year, and this will be the first time the Judge Johnson Award is, is presented in recognition of his passing. Uh, as we begin, <clears throat> should you have a technical issue today, please email us at staff at pmzonline.org. Today's presenter is discussing general legal topics. He is not giving legal advice. Should you wish specific legal advice, please consult an attorney of your choice. The program is being recorded, and the recording will be available at our website, pmconline.org. And if you look for the link to resources and program recordings, you'll be able to see the entire program. Uh, I would like to emphasize that we want to hear your questions. So can you please put your questions uh, for the presenter in the chat? And then we are, will have a slide at the end of the presentation and we will go through the chat. So Carl Zachariah is licensed to practice law here in Pennsylvania and Florida. 
He has 25 years of experience dealing with elder law and estate planning issues. He also deals with creating planning strategies for entire families. He has taught um, at the Community College of Allegheny County, Penn State University, and California State University. And he has published Good Long-Term Care, How to Find It, Get It, and Pay for It. It's copyrighted 2014 on Amazon, but you can get the updated version is available on Amazon Kindle eBooks. Mr. Zachariah. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, PMC, for having me here. This is an area I've been practicing in for, well, for 27 or 28 years. I very much enjoy estate planning, estate administration, and we also have a big elder loss wing to ours, which involves the costs of long-term care and how that all plays into estate administration. And it actually plays in in a very big way in some cases, and I'll be talking about that. I tend to be a little bit informal in my presentation style, a little bit folksy, if you will. I hope that's okay. I hope all of you enjoy that, and most people do. And um, as far as estate work, it, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I do have Florida as well as Pennsylvania, and I can give you the balance on how they do things differently in, in different states. And, and I, in fact, I'll start off with that. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, People that here on TV, um, Susie Orman being the, the primary proponent of the revocable trust. And the revocable trust can be a very good tool, but they talk about the delays and the time associated with probate and how it's a court overseen event with judicial involvement. And that is exactly how it is in Florida. There, it, there's a petition, everything's overseen by a judge. Everything must be approved by a judge. And that is why some people that have non-complicated estates will use a revocable trust instead of a will. It's not like that in Pennsylvania. There is no need for judicial involvement, any court appearances or hearings, unless somebody files a petition to bring an issue that confronts them and the family um, with regard to the administration of the state before a judge. Okay. With that, I'll get to that, I think, a little bit more. Uh, can we go to the next slide? <laughs> so in Pennsylvania, generally, every county, except for a couple, has an office called the Register of Wills. And the Register of Wills is associated with the courts, the Orphan's Court Division in the state. It's, uh, it's, where, it's where your estates get probated. Now, in Allegheny County, we're one of those couple of counties that do not really have a register of wills. We do, but not anymore. Now it's all governed by the Department of Court Records. I believe Philadelphia County is the other county. It's the same function, the same purpose. And if you look for the register of wills, you'll find it, but it's actually the Department of Court Records. It's on the first floor of the city county building in Pittsburgh. It's on the third floor of the courthouse in Greensburg. Uh, I think it's the second floor in, in Beaver County. And They've just moved from the first floor in Washington County to another floor that I've not been to yet. So it's all, everything happens at the Register of Wills. Um, an estate for, you know, I've all often looked for the definition of the word estate because if I have an estate, well, what, what is that? That is, I think, everything that I own. If I own something jointly with my son, is that part of my estate? or is that joint property that's maybe not part of my estate. So the word estate can kind of take on different meanings. And I'll break it down into the, these uh, maybe three or four general categories. You have your um, assets that are in your name alone. When you die, if there's no beneficiary associated with them and not owned jointly, they will go through your probate estate. Probate means to prove the will, Latin term, to prove that that's where you file the original the last will and testament of the deceased person at the register of wills in the county that you're in. Um, those assets are governed by that will. But, you know, many people have assets that are not part of the probate estate. You have an IRA, you have an annuity, you have life insurance. Those have beneficiary designations on them. They are governed by those beneficiary designations and not by the will. 
So if I have an IRA and I leave everything to my son and daughter, I pass away, the will has no say over that. It goes to my son and daughter by virtue of the IRA beneficiary designation. Now, what if I never filled out that beneficiary designation? Well, now the errors would be my will. It would be determined by, by my will. My will catches everything that doesn't go somewhere else. Okay? Um, and so there's the, the, the beneficiary designation assets, the jointly held assets. There's assets in your name alone. And then there's a POD or POD, transfer on death, payable on death assets. They kind of fall into the beneficiary designation. And then the fourth one would be trust assets, which maybe we'll talk about in a bit. Next slide, please. So the question is, do I need to probate an estate? Really a great question. Most of the time when somebody has real estate and that real estate is titled in their name, which would be on the deed. And so if I own property and it's deeded in my name, I pass away. My will, most of the time, my will is going to govern where that real estate goes after I pass away. Now, if it's in my name and my wife's name, and my wife's passed away, but I have not yet changed the deed, nor do you have to, frankly, but it says my name and my wife's name, but she died before I do, it still goes through my will. If I own it jointly with somebody, my wife, we own it together as husband and wife, she passes away, I own the whole thing. If she and I own it as tenants in common, which is a very big distinction, husband and wife or joint tenancy versus tenants in common, if she passed away, the estate is, the real estate is owned one half by me and one half by her estate. Now that's normally not the case. Most of the time it's held as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, husband and wife being the same thing uh, as opposed to tenants in common. <coughs> so that real estate will go through there. I have bank accounts, cash at home, personal items. If they're in my name alone, they go through my, my will. Uh, probate, so the question is, do you have to open up an estate? And the, the, the answer is that that has to be looked at by somebody. But if all the assets are accessible, if, if someone passes away with an IRA, life insurance, uh, life insurance in a joint bank account, um, you really don't need to probate the estate. Uh, there's nothing there that would require the appointment letters from the court, which are called letters, uh, court appointment letters or letters of administration or letters testamentary, depending on whether or not there was a will. We call them short certificates in Pennsylvania. Um, and so when someone tells you you need a short certificate, it sounds like that's something that's really easy to go and get. You just need a short certificate. Go down to the courthouse and get a short certificate. It's th that's a probate process. When you get a short certificate, you have probated the will, and you now have a legal obligation to follow all of the rules and laws of the state in probating that estate properly. Okay, so getting a short certificate sounds like a simple thing to do. Run down to the courthouse and get one. When you get that, you, you filed the will, you filed the death certificate, you paid the filing fee, you now have a whole set of legal obligations you brought upon yourself. But if you don't have any of those assets, if, if it's, as I said, a joint bank account, an IRA, an annuity, all with beneficiary designations, that does not have to be probated. You do, however, have to pay inheritance taxes on all of those, except for the life insurance. Life insurance is the one big asset with every estate that you don't need to pay inheritance tax. That, but that's about it. That, and if the, uh, the person that passed away owed an IRA and the decedent, the person that passed away, was under the age of 59 and one half, you don't have to pay inheritance taxes on that IRA. But if they're over the age of 59 and a half, you do have to pay inheritance taxes on that IRA. And by the way, an IRA has income tax obligations as well. Next slide. So here's a nice little chart here. Did the owner, own, and you can just sort of follow this on your own. Did the, does he own a property? No, you don't need to probate the estate. 
But if the, all the property was done jointly, you don't need to. If if there's if there's beneficiaries, you don't need to. But if you have any of these, if you have an asset, basically it comes down to if you have an asset that's in the deceased person's name alone, you need to probate that estate to get to that asset. Now, as with everything in law, and if I learned one thing in law school back in way back when when I went to law school, is that there is no absolutes. There's always exceptions. So if you follow the chart and the and the asset happens to be a vehicle, you don't have to probate an estate to get a vehicle. You can go to the AAA, the, the pen dot, and transfer title with proof of the um, death and the ownership and transfer title without probating the estate. If, if the decedent had, all, all they had was simply a, um, a, a bank account worth less than $10,000. And it's in their name alone. You don't need to probate the estate to get access to that. You can go to the bank with the death certificate and with a copy of the paid funeral receipt and get everything that's in that account as next of kin. You have to prove that as well. You can't be some neighbor or something off the street. Um, you, there's a, a relationship requirement. And you can get all the access to that money without probating that estate. Death certificates. Proof of relationship, um, paid funeral receipt. That's Title 26 and 3101. It comes up all the time. Uh, so be aware of that as well. Okay. Next slide, please. Do you need a lawyer to probate a state? My personal answer to that, I think, is going to be yes, of course. But it's not a mandate, it's not legally required. And you can do so without a lawyer because, again, there is no real judicial process involved in Pennsylvania's probate process. But having a lawyer involved who knows what they're doing is, of course, extremely helpful and will help keep you safe. And by when I say keep you safe, there are many gotchas that can go, come up and affect you personally. One of the very few people know about is that whenever you probate an estate, one of the requirements is that you contact the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services to find out if that person ever received any Medicaid. And if they did, you've got to get that, you have to uh, consider the claim that the state has for their Medicaid claim. If you do not do that, the executor is on the hook personally for that, that amount. So it's, it's, people think it's easy. And really, it's not, it's not terribly hard, but you really need to know what you're doing. And then if you don't know what you're doing and there's any kind of issues that come up, you could be, you could be in trouble. Distribute, some people will distribute the money within a month or two after the person passes away. Uh, they distribute everything. They think they've taken care of everything. And then um, you know, January, February rolls around. It's time to file the tax return for the deceased person. And they didn't do that. Now they found out that they owe taxes. Now you have to go back to the people you distributed the money to to get that money to pay the taxes. And if they won't give it to you, well, now you're probably going to have to hire a lawyer to get help. And so there's a number of gotchas out there that you have to be aware of. Uh, and if you don't do it right, you can have a uh, personal liability. Uh, I'm just going to address somebody who's popped up here on my screen, the 59 and a half. If the deceased person is under the age of 59 and a half, inheritance taxes are not due. It does not matter what the age of the recipient, the living recipient of the IRA is. If the deceased person was under the age of 59 and a half, inheritance taxes are not paid. Okay. So again, if you want to do this on your own, that's up to you. That would not be my recommendation, of course, as a lawyer. I couldn't recommend that, but it's doable. You just have to be very concerned that you do it all correctly. And I'm going to get into a few of these as we go through these. Next slide, please. Oh, here we go, okay. So some of the problem areas that, we could, that they face is the payment of creditors. Um, you know, whenever somebody passes away, there's always credit card bills. There's um, the funeral bill. 
There's the cost of opening up the estate. There's um, loans from other people. There's that Medicaid claim. There's always medical bills. And who gets paid what? Especially if there's not enough money. If you have a, a $200,000 estate and $250,000 in bills, who gets paid? There's not enough. Uh, that I've encountered this, you know, a significant number of times in my career. There is this priority of who gets paid first. And if there's not enough money, you have to prorate them in, in the precise amounts according to their, their claim status levels. So that's a that's a problem here. You gotta be careful of that. I touched upon the Medicaid claims. You've got to file a claim or a request for a claim from the Department of Human Services for any Medicaid that may have paid out. They will, they're pretty responsive. It's usually a day or two. They get back to you and tell you whether or not that person had any Medicaid uh, payments on their behalf. And if so, whether any of those are recoverable by the, um, uh, by the Commonwealth. I have a pet peeve on this next one. Who pays the taxes and who pays the expenses of the estate, the funeral, the wake, these debts and expenses? Who pays this, particularly when you have an estate that's comprised of various assets? Maybe we have uh, an IRA with the beneficiaries and we have an annuity with the beneficiaries and we have a joint bank account and we have a house. Who pays the taxes on all those? And my soapbox is this, look at your will, if you have one, and take a look at that paragraph dealing with who pays the taxes and the expenses. Because many, far too many in my opinion, state that the probate estate pays the taxes and the expenses on everything. That's a problem. Why is that a problem? I've had too many cases where these, these problems have come up. You have that sort of paragraph where it says the probate estate pays the taxes and the probate estate consists of the home. That's it, just the home. It's a $200,000 home, we'll say. And the decedent <coughs> left that to um, their children. Then they have a, um, uh, another, maybe the annuity that the decedent left for their girlfriend. Uh, and under those circumstances, when the will reads that way, that the probate estate pays the taxes and the expenses, well, the children are going to pay the taxes on that annuity for the girlfriend, who, by the way, is going to be at a 15% inheritance tax, as opposed to the children, which would be 4.5%. Your inheritance taxes are based on your relationship. I'm going to touch upon that. But if you can imagine that that, that issue, that when, when I say girlfriend, you could probably tell that's a, that was a case that I had, because of course it was. So you have to be very careful in how you do all this stuff. You know, if you, if you just had everybody try to pay the taxes, the, the girlfriend in this example has a brother who's an attorney, and he looks at that, he says, no, 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 no. I want the estate to pay the taxes on this, not my sister. She's not paying this. Now you get into all kinds of trouble. So you just have to be aware of all these issues that could confront you. Uh, when you're probating the estate. Yeah, something that, that I did not get into and we have not gotten into in this is that the filing of the will itself, if it's, re if it's notarized and has two witnesses on it, um, you can go ahead and open up the estate with that. But if it's not notarized, you've got to find those witnesses. If you can't find the witnesses, you have to bring two people in who know the person's signature. It can be quite an ordeal. Or you can have a situation like I had um, Last Friday, when I went down to see the good people at the Register of Wills, Department of Court Records in Allegheny County, and my client brought the will in, and as we look at it, she wrote all over it. Her husband had passed away. In any place that had his name, she scratched it out. That's not a probatable will. Not right then and there. Though. I had to file a petition uh, to uh, accept the will despite interlineations and deletions writing something on it, scratching things out. So there's, there's lots of issues involved with, with, the, uh, with the probate process um, that you need to be aware of. And again, if you don't do any of these things in the proper way, the, the, there is personal liability on the report of the executor. Um, 
Next slide, please, Tom. Okay, so there are, um, I talked about probate estates and joint estates. This is just probate estates. Now we're just talking about what gets filed with the register of wills. And there's generally two types. There's testate, that means the person died with the will. And the executor is the person named in there who's responsible for administering and executing the directives in the will for the deceased person. And then there's intestate, which of course means without a will. That is, that is called a, um, the person who does that is not the executor, it's called the administrator. And they will get letters of administration, which are again, short certificates. Some of the died with the will will receive letters testamentary. And it just tells you whether or not there is a will or not. Administration means no will. Uh, testacy means, of course, that there, there is a will. And when you are in test state, there is, there's no will. So the question is twofold. Who inherits everything? And secondly, who is the administrator? Again, same term as executor, but no will. They're called an administrator. So the question is, then, who receives everything? Well, you, you need a lawyer to figure this out. You know, in, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, I, I, have, I have one recently where the deceased man, he died rather young. He had a large estate. He had a lot of businesses. Uh, 20 plus million dollars is the value of the estate. And he never had a will done. Well, if there's no will, he was married and he had children. And all of his children were the children of his surviving spouse. In that case, the heirs are his spouse takes the first $30,000, and the rest of the estate is split 50-50 between the spouse and the children. This caused us an issue because the children are young in their 20s, um, and this was a large estate, and the children inheriting uh, all this money, uh, you know, $10 million, you'll say, well, they've got to pay 4.5% inheritance tax on it. Which would seem fine if they're inheriting $10 million. They were inheriting $10 million worth of assets, which were basically commercial buildings. So they don't have that kind of money. What is 4.5% of $10 million? I'll let you do the math, but I think it's about $450,000. They don't have anywhere near that. That's a problem. How do you deal with that? But back to intestacy. Um, it's if, if the uh, the person was married and they have children, but not all of their children are from the same spouse, then it's split 50-50 between the spouse and the uh, children. And if they have no spouse, but they have children, it goes to the children. And they follow something called a per stirpes distri uh, distribution, which means if one of the children, say, died before, before their children. Sorry, I didn't turn my phone off. If, if one of the children died before the parent did, uh, their children, their, the grandchildren of the deceased person would, would all share the share that uh, would have gone to the de deceased child of the um, deceased person. Um, one thing I, I want to touch upon, there, there's also little things in there that you need to be aware of. Like with my large estate I just mentioned to you, I'm having the children disclaim. And disclaimer means they're saying that I do not want the asset, pass it on to where it would go without me, which would mean to the mother in this case. And we're going to be able to avoid this $450,000 tax bill that nobody has by having all the children disclaim back to the mother. There are things that the lawyers can do to um, uh, protect everybody. It's not an absolute that you had to pay the taxes. So you got to be aware of things like that. So back to intestacy, state law governs everything and it, it, it all flows out um, all the way down to second cousins and then some. It's all based upon your degree of relationship to the person. I had one down in Miami, which has their own intestate laws, which are very similar to Pennsylvania's. An 89 year old man, no brothers or sisters, of course, no living parents, no children, never married, passes away with no will. Well, 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 who's that go to? 
Well, as it would be in Pennsylvania, it was there. I had to trace down each of his parents, his mother and his father. Half went to his father's side and half went to his mother's side. And I had to trace down their brothers and sisters and, 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 and their children. I had they came up with um, 85 different heirs, each receiving in a different level because of that whole Persterpes distribution. This one had three children. This one died and went down to these two down here. It gets very convoluted, but it works. <coughs> okay, part of the estate, I already talked about this. You have the beneficiary designation estate, the joint estate, and the probate estate. Inside the probate estate, there could be specific gifts, or primarily, it's the, the primary item is the residuary. If I have a, an estate where I have, um, I say I leave $10,000 to each of my four grandchildren, I leave everything else to my two children, then those grandchildren would get their $10,000 first, and then the children would split the remainder of it. The residuary estate is basically everything else you have left in the world that hasn't gone somewhere else. That's who splits everything. And when I use the word gifts here, you might see the terms bequest and devises. A, a devise is a transfer of real estate. A bequest is money and basically everything else that's not real estate. Next. Um, so again, the executor is the name person in the will, or if it's, if it's intestate, the heirs have to determine amongst themselves who's going to be the administrator, and the others have to file a piece of paper called a renunciation. You have to go to the register of wills with a death certificate. Uh, we don't use the estate information sheet in, 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 in the counties that I deal with anymore. A death certificate, uh, the original of the will. Uh, if, if there's no will, then renunciations from the people renouncing. There's no witnesses and oaths of the witnesses that um, were there for the signing of the will originally. Um, a copy of the death certificate along with the original. Uh, in, in most counties, it's $300 or less to open up an estate. Have to have their ID, generally speaking. Not, usually when there's a lawyer involved, they don't, but... They do if they, they do otherwise. You go to the register of wills, you take that paperwork to the counter, and if everything beats the guidelines, the, the uh, register of wills will swear that person in, ask them how many short certificates they want, and then they will give them their short certificates. You can now go to the bank with a short certificate, a death certificate, and an EIN number for the estate, a taxpayer ID number for the estate, and you can start collect, opening up an estate account, start collecting the assets, and put them in that estate account. Uh, probate can begin really anytime after the person dies. Um, inheritance taxes are due within nine months of date of death. Um, so you want generally you want to get the estate open as quickly as possible. Next slide. Okay, file the will. Determine who the executor is. Okay, I went through all these. Um, ID. Um, the original will, take a copy as well. They always want a copy. And the probate fee, the value of the, the what, I told you $300 or less, that's in a state of unknown value. If you know what the value is, you could put it on there. <clears throat> and the cost to probate the estate is greater based upon the value of the estate. I almost always go with an unknown value, the lowest value possible for probating it, which in Allegheny County is usually 200 to, $260 to open the estate, depending on how many short certificates I want. Uh, and I make up the cost later when I file the inventory, which I'll talk about in a moment. Next. Uh, we're, we're not gonna, we don't really do this in, in Allegheny County or Washington County or Butler County, so I'm gonna skip this one, next. Okay, this is the petition. It's a two page sheet of paper. It's used statewide. It, it just asks you if uh, this is a probate petition. Is it testate or intestate? If it's testate, who the executor is or the executors are. If it's intestate, who the administrator is and who all the heirs are. They want to know those. And then they do their calculation. You pay your fee. They ask you, they swear you in. You promise to follow the laws of Commonwealth and of Pennsylvania and everything you put in here is true and correct. And then you say, I do. And they, where you're in, collect your money, and give you your short certificates. 
It's not a hard process. Next. After you get that, you get your, your short, as I said, the short certificate is what is called colloquially in Pennsylvania. Other states will call it letters of supplementary or letters of administration. And they give the, the, uh, the executor, I'll just use that term, the power to do anything that deceased person can do. They have access to all of their assets that are part of the probate estate. They have um, the ability to uh, pay their debts, open the estate account, distribute the assets. They kind of take charge of everything. Next slide. Okay. So after you get sworn in, you have to now give notice to all of the heirs. You have to send them this document called a notice of beneficial interest. That the, it's, it's online. You can get it at the register of wills uh, on their website. All heirs have to be given notice of the opening of the estate. You have to then send a document called a certification notice to the register of wills for that estate where they file that. You go to advertise the estate. Uh, in two papers, one is a paper of general circulation, the Post Gazette or the Tribune Review. The other is the County Legal Journal, journal the Allegheny County Law Journal, uh, the legal journals for you know Westmoreland County or Washington County, all those. You've got to get an EIN number online at the IRS. It's a simple process; it takes ten minutes. Uh, but you go online and you get the EIN from them. That is the taxpayer ID number. If you open up an estate. And there was interest earned by the checking account, or after the person passed away, there are dividends and interest that comes in. That person's deceased, so they will no longer be charged off interest to their social security number. Now all that interest gets charged off to the EIN number for the estate. And a separate return has to be done in the following year called a 1041. And each of the people inheriting get their share of the income ta income for their own tax return on something called a K-1 form. Uh, identify the assets, open the account, prioritize the debts. You file this document called an inventory, which lists all of the probate assets. If I have a house, an IRA, and a joint bank account, the only asset that goes on that inventory would be the house. That's the only one that's a probate asset. And then you file the Pennsylvania inheritance tax, the federal state tax, if need be. The federal state tax right now has to be in a state valued at greater than $12 million. Um, and the state income tax return, the personal return for the deceased person as well. Um, I'll just touch upon this for anybody to whom it might be relevant. If you have a, a married couple and one of the spouses passes away, let's say they're, they're, they're worth over $5 million, even if everything's going to your spouse, you should file the federal estate tax return so you can grab that $12 million exemption for the spouse when she passes away. She will have her own exemption. This changes pretty much every year, but she'll be able to add her husband's $12 million to it. If that confused you, don't worry about it. But if you have an estate that's worth $5 million or more, you need to talk to somebody about that, and I'd be happy to. Um, then when you go to close the account, you don't just distribute the money and say, see ya. You need to have some paperwork that shows that everybody is happy that they've gotten their full disclosure uh, and that they have no complaints about how you handled the estate as the executor because you still have that personal liability hanging over you out there. Um, you want to um, get something in writing from them. You can go to court with a full-blown 12-page accounting of everything that came in, and everything that went out. You can go to court and get a judicial uh, court order saying that you're discharged, the estate is done. And if anybody has a complaint, you can come and complain about it. Uh, if they don't, they'll just close it. Or you can simply do a family agreement, have a, an informal accounting and everybody sign off on it. You can then distribute the assets and close the estate. I always, 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 always hold back some money for at least a year. How much? It depends on my view of the case. If this person had a lot of debtors, I'm gonna hold back a lot and not distribute at all for a while. I don't wanna have my, my executor, my client, have any liability for payment of taxes or, or payment of any bills uh, and then have already distributed all the money. That's a big problem. 
So we're going to hold off on doing that. But if there aren't any, I bank hold back a lot less. Generally speaking, I'm going to hold back maybe at least $10,000 for one year. I mentioned it earlier up here, number three, you advertise the estate. Why do you advertise the estate? You advertise the estate, um, and it runs once a week for three weeks in a paper, general circulation, and that legal journal. Anybody who claims that this deceased person owed them money has to file a one-page statement of claim at that docket number in that county, say, hey, this deceased person owes me money. And if they don't do that, and more than one year runs after this advertising, they have no claims. It shortens your statute of limitations as to claims, which on most transactions, contract transactions, like credit cards is four years. Um, with, the, with the advertising, it's there down to just one year from the third date that advertisement comes. I'm giving you a lot of stuff here. I'm realizing, boy, this is a lot. I hope it's understandable. Next. <laughs> Okay, we talked about this, the notice to beneficiaries. It's uh, simply this piece of paper that you have, to, you have to send out within 60 days of uh, opening the estate, notifying the beneficiaries that you are a beneficiary in this estate. They will then get notice of everything. Let's move on because I'm running out of time here. After you notify these heirs, this is what the form looks like. It's the one on the, in the middle there or on the left, I guess. Uh, that's the, uh, it's called an important notice, notice of the state administration. You know, you'll send this out to the people and they'll say, what is this? It's a piece of paper intended to tell you that you have a, an interest in the state of somebody who passed away. After the executor notifies everybody of this, they then must file with the register of wills one copy of this certification of notice that says, on this date, I have notified all of the heirs and here's who they are. And you list them, and you sign it, and you send it in certifying that you've given them notice. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, I've already, I've already talked about this. Two papers, once a week for three weeks, one year run, and they got to file their statement of claim. Next, please. Okay, now you make a list of all the assets they had. And where do you get these? There is no central repository that says what everybody has, all their assets. There is no such thing. So where do you get it? Well, you look in their personal records. You look in last year's tax returns. They're getting, they're getting um, interest from Jenny Montgomery Scott or dividends from Prudential. Well, you know they must have an account with Jenny and they must have stock in Prudential. You also should check with unclaimed property. You know, I don't know if, if any of you have never checked unclaimed property. You should check out unclaimed property because uh, there might be money out there in your name. Might not be a lot, but it's worth checking. When I first uh, moved back from Florida years ago when this whole concept came out of unclaimed property, I went right to Florida and checked. And I had $70 owed to me from Florida Power and Light from um, the deposit I put down for my utilities when I lived out in uh, Miami back, way back when. So check with unclaimed property. Close the accounts, close the bank accounts, shut down the credit cards, turn those off, determine the date you use, the date of death value. When you're paying inheritance taxes, you use the date of death values. If that, if that investment account had $10,000 in it, and when the person passed away, it's not worth $11,000, you pay inheritance taxes on $10,000. And, um, you yeah, know, I, I, I want to touch upon this. This is, one of, my, one of my other soapbox items, I am always having people say, come to me and say, I want to put my house into my children's name because um, when I die, I don't want them to pay inheritance taxes. That's a really, really bad idea almost all the time. Despite the fact you're giving your house away to your kids, they now own it and control it. When they sell that house, probably after you're dead, when they sell that house, they think they beat the system and they don't have to pay inheritance taxes. Then they sell the house and then January the following year, they get a 1099. And they give it to their CPA and say, what's this all about? So, well, it looks like you sold real estate that was not your home. You've got to pay capital gains taxes on that. When you inherit something, you don't have to pay capital gains taxes because your basis, which is what your gains are determined from, 
or, or calculate, they get, they're called stepped up. They become the fair market value on date of death, what you put down on that inheritance tax return. And capital gains is, is, is um, 20% of the gain is your tax. So if your parents paid $40,000 for the house, it's worth $240,000. They gave it to the kids. The kids now sell it. They get $240,000 for it. Their basis is mom's basis because she gave it to them. And then that two forty minus forty is a two hundred thousand dollar gain. That's a forty thousand dollar capital gains tax. And if they should never done that, if the kids simply inherited it, it'd be four and a half percent of two hundred forty thousand, which is what eleven thousand dollars maybe twelve thousand dollars versus forty. Big difference. Sorry to jump off on that one, but I thought it needed <laughs> to be told. Next slide, please. Okay, in the inventory, this is, has to be filed within nine months of date of death. The same form, you state why it's a listing of all of the probate assets only. You don't put an IRA on there if the, there's beneficiaries. You don't put a joint account on there if the surviving joint owner is alive, just the probate assets. And that extra money that I mentioned, uh, that's usually $300 or less, and I pay the greater amount when I file the inventory, that's this. I had a small estate I was working on this morning. It was about $150,000. And I think the fee was $220 to file this. So it's, this goes up based upon the value. <laughs> Next. Then you file the, the income taxes. You file the inheritance tax return, uh, an original plus a copy. Uh, if you pay the taxes, just an estimate of the taxes within... 90 days of date of death, you get a 5% discount. And the rates are, there's no tax to charities, there's no tax to your spouse, but to any lineal heirs, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, parents, grandparents, everyone in your column, your line, it's 4.5%. If it's to your brothers and sisters, it's 12%. And to everybody else, it's 15%. Most of the time, inheritance is not taxable income for the beneficiary unless it's an IRA or an annuity. That still has an income tax debt to it. But if it's a, you know, a checking account you know, that you've inherited, you pay the inheritance taxes, there's no income tax for that. It's not taxable income. And that's, that, uh, that's called income in respect of a decedent, usually with an IRA and an annuity. Next slide. Carl, can I... Can I ask yes. that we, if, if you could go over this slide and then we'll go to the question slide. Okay, this. Um, this is a statutory priority that I mentioned. This is the order of who gets paid what when there's not enough money. The administrative expenses, open up the estate, the executive fee, the legal fee, those are the top priority. Family exemptions for somebody that lived in the house with the deceased person, that's $3,500. Funerals are next. And then Medicaid and medical bills for the past six months prior to the person dying. And then you see, you see the very bottom are credit cards. Don't, don't go rushing off and paying credit cards right away, particularly when there might not be enough, um, enough money to do so. Okay, let's go to the questions. So let's see here. The first question, most recent is, is your beneficiaries, if your beneficiaries live in another state, do they owe PA inheritance tax? Yes. It, let, next question. In your experience, does advertising the estate lead to fraudulent claims? No. I, I, I've had one case where there was an issue that I thought it was fraudulent and we denied it. I said, yeah, we're not paying. So he took us to court and he lost. I still think it was fraudulent. That's a side story. <laughs> Great. Um, and then uh, one more. How is a house valued upon death for inheritance tax purposes, assuming it continues to be held by the inheritor, not sold? That You are establishing your basis. And I touched upon that. That could probably be a one-hour class all by itself. Capital gains <laughs> and inheriting. But you are establishing your basis. So if that is going to be your home, the, the state wants to you at least to have the fair market value determined by the county, which in Allegheny County is the assessed value times 1.23, the common level ratio. That is what your, the minimum must be 
unless you get an appraisal done and show that it was something less than that. But if you're going to sell it, I generally wait until we sell the property. Then once we sell it, that's the amount I put down on the air in section. We sold it for 240, 240. That's the value. Just to get that basis step up for my clients. Mm -hmm. And then one of the last questions, if you are an executor, can you ask a lawyer or someone else to be the executor after the person dies? I see that a number of times. I, I have done it myself maybe three times in the past 28 years. Yeah, you can. I, I just don't think it looks right. The lawyers being the executor and the lawyer. I mean, they just, frankly, they double collect on that. And, uh, I think it's better. Let the lawyer guide you with everything and let mm -hmm. the executor be the close family member that everybody can work with. But if there's no trust or if there's nobody, nobody around at all, then the, the lawyer will typically do it. Okay, and one last question. If an estate was closed because of delays in resolving due to one stock not being transferred, is it hard to reopen to conclude property? Um, estates really don't close in Pennsylvania unless you go to court with that formal accounting and ask for a formal discharge. Even those can be reopened. But you know, most, most estates, only the really big ones seem to go down that road or the really troubled ones go down that road. Estates don't really close. So if somebody died seven years ago and you just did a family agreement and you need another short certificate, well, you can get one. You get the updated short certificate from the uh, uh, Department of Court Records or Register Wills, and you go and you, um, you, you, you get that asset that you needed, and you file uh, an updated inventory, an updated inheritance tax return, and uh, you distribute the money. They're called supplementals, not updated, supplementals. Great. I have a question for you all. Do I talk too fast? Because I think I <laughs> <laughs> No, Carl. Perfect speed. Michelle? If that's the last question, we'll go back on to the PowerPoint. There's one more question. Um, that okay. came in. It says, you don't like the wording that probated estate pays expenses. What do you recommend instead? Typically, mine will say that each individual that inherits from this estate will pay their, their fair share of their taxes, their taxable amounts. Great. That's it. So, I mean, we have a couple minutes left, so we can go back. Perfect. Okay. Okay. I think let's go. Let's... You want to just finish those last couple there? Yeah, perfect. Just yes, please. Go, 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 go forward a couple slides to closing the estate. Oh, actually, I'll give you this one right here. Go back, go back one more. Let's talk about that for a minute. Transferring real property. Okay, real estate doesn't transfer automatically upon death unless there's a life estate deed. So, you know, if the when you're selling real property through a probate estate, you want to make sure you use something called a fiduciary deed. And a fiduciary deed is a deed from an estate. It's the executor saying, hey, this was not my home. I did not live there. I, you know, you have to check your own on you know, the, the liens and taxes and sewer liens and whether claims might be out there. I didn't live there. I can't really warrant anything about this estate, this home, because it was not mine. So that's the kind of deed you want to use that protects you as the executor because you were telling them, I didn't live there and I can make no warranties about the title to this property. Get title insurance. Um, and also that if the executor is the one taking the property, you may need court approval to approve the executor taking ownership of the property. Now, I don't think that's the case if the executor is the sole heir, but if there's other heirs, then you may need to go to court to get um, approval or get written approval, at least of the heirs. Let's go to the last, last one, the closing of the estate. And then within two years of the opening up the estate, you need to file something called a status report. And it's simply a report saying that the estate is or is not Closed. Again, they never really closed, but whether it's completed, I think is a better term that they use. 
So this is the last filing that must take place. Uh, and occasionally, honestly, I forget to file this one and they'll send me notice, you haven't filed your status report, where is it? I pull it up and I fill it out and I send it in right away. Uh, so, so that's basically the end of the, uh, of the whole state. But if something else comes up, generally you can still go back and get uh, additional um, short certificates. If you guys have any questions, my email is info at pittsburghelderlaw.com. I'm more than happy to answer anything you have. I'm in front of this computer way too often. So I'll probably answer your questions pretty quickly. There it is. And if I could put one little, uh, little advertisement in, I do a radio show on KDKA radio, two Saturdays a month, this Saturday at 12 noon, AM 1020, from noon to one. I'll be on KDK with Rob Pratt, and we just take calls. People calling with questions about this stuff, about wills, about Medicaid and elder law. So feel free to call into that show, and I'll answer them there as well. Any other questions, Michelle? Nope. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, PMC. I very much appreciate it. If you wish to get in contact with us, there's our website, pmconline.org. Thank you to the audience for participating. Thank you to Carl Zachariah and to the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh and the Allegheny County Law Library for hosting. We appreciate your attendance. Have a good day.